map bang, map bang. Let me see if I can find this. The two hour stun lock. It's there's nothing wrong with having fun, you know. Uh, in fact, I would go so far as to say that it's actually super cool. No, I've seen that wood plat. We've talked about that on stream before. Um, it was the How Did Triangles Shrink France? We Top were talking about. Whoa, chill. We were talking about how bad border estimations were back before satellites. Hold on, it's only six minutes, then we'll do the politics, okay? Hey Mark, what country am I supposed to be? Oh, by the way, they're British, but these are the only two British people. Legit, I've watched like every video of theirs. It's good, they're good. <laughs> Offensive France? Bienvenue à Homme Carte. Nous sommes les hommes? Et voilà, la carte! Homme Carte, Homme Carte, Homme, Homme, Homme Carte, Carte. The Cassini family map of France is quite possibly the most incredible map ever made. Considering how old it is, very, it's astonishing how accurate it is. Also very, and the story behind it is pretty astonishing too. Before the Cassinis, the best map of France looked like this. Not bad. But also, definitely not good. In those days, maps weren't very precise. They were more like works of art. But King Louis XIV wanted to know exactly what he was king of, and he wanted a great big map on his bedroom wall. So he called his cartographer friend Giovanni Cassini. Monsieur, uh, je voudrais uh, une carte. Une carte? Une carte, oui, une carte. Uh, uh, très grande uh, de mon France. Bof, je commence. But of course, it was a lot trickier than just saying bof. When Cassini googled satellite photography, he found an article saying that it wouldn't be invented for another 300 years. So Cassini had no option but to use an old-fashioned yet ingenious process called triangulation. Triangulation works by making triangles. You start by measuring the distance between two points. Then you spy out a third point and measure the angles towards it with a massive protractor. Using these measurements, and a bit of maths, you can plot a stunningly accurate triangle on your map, no matter how big or bumpy the terrain is. Simply repeat the process over and over again, et voila, a complete and thoroughly accurate map. Cassini travelled around France with his triangle measuring machinery for years and years until he was too dead to carry on. So his son, Cassini Jr., took over from his dead dad and continued measuring. Then Cassini Jr. died and was replaced by his son, Cassini Jr. Jr., the first Cassini's grandson. They had first names, you know. No one cares. Back then, France was mostly a poverty-stricken rural backwater and not overly partial to the arrival of strangers. Plus ça change. This made map-making a dangerous endeavour. In 1740, the villagers in Les Estables brutally hacked one of Cassini's surveyors to death, believing their strange tools and modern science were the cause of their failed harvest. Bang, 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 bang. This is the enlightened Western civilization that Nazis want to return to, by the way. Literally a guy walking around with, like, a protractor and, like, a ruler, and they're like, witchcraft. They fucking maul him to death. Bang, bang, ow, bang, ow, ow, bang, bang. But eventually, the Cassinis covered all 600,000 square French kilometers of France and produced this, a map made entirely of triangles. The king, who by now was a different king, was delighted until he noticed something wrong. Zut alors, qu'est-ce que c'est? Is there a problem? My country is 20% smaller than I thought it was. You have taken more from me than I won in all my wars. I actually said this. But your highness, you literally asked for an accurate map. Well, you could at least bother to fill it in with some details, like uh, villages and rivers, so it's not just f triangle. So Cassini Jr. Jr. set about turning his very accurate map into a very useful map. Every church, every farm, every copse, every petrol station was painstakingly marked in the very first modern map of its kind. And then Cassini Jr. Jr. died and was replaced by Cassini Jr. Jr. II until the job was finished. Four generations of the same family taking over 120 years to complete a task is a pretty impressive level of commitment. In today's terms, that's like someone watching a YouTube video all the way to the end. <laughs> <laughs> In 1793, the Cassini family's now completed enormous 12 by 11 meter map comprising 182 sheets of incroyable detail was proudly stolen by the people who'd executed the king the year before. Napoleon decided the Cassini family's long association with the crown made them enemies of the revolution. And so they confiscated the map, prevented its public use, and threw Cassini in jail. Napoleon milked the map for magnificent military manoeuvres. Buff. It also inspired the Ordnance Survey maps here in Britain, and ushered in an age where maps were less about art and more about accurate accuracy. How astonishing. But perhaps the most astonishing thing about... Oh, that's my time up. Now time for my son to take over. Your son? Yep. Here you go, Jay Jr. Just carry on where I left off. Oh, no. 
didn't know he had a son. Yes. What I, I fucking love these guys, dude. Hold on, wait. Can we do one more? Hold on. I'm sorry. They're, they're really good. They're the only good British YouTubers. Wait, hold on. Where was the one... Where was the map with the clock making? Where was the clock making one? That was the... That one was fucking... <gasps> oh, shit, on, dude. This is... Guys, this is like an entire fucking history class distilled into one video. Finish the video. The rest of the video is an ad. They have long ads at the end of their videos, and I don't mind, because their videos are all great. What's the use in a map without them? There are thousands, possibly more. Coordinates. What's the use in a map without them? There are thousands, possibly more. But for navigating seamen, they were critical. This is the story of how one man overcame the odds to solve one of the world's greatest riddles. Welcome to Map Men. We're the men. And here's the map. Map Men, Map Men, Map. Ah, yes. Uh, sorry, this isn't a map. It's a clock. It's a clock. But it's a map thing. The mapping men, mapping men, map, map, map. Longitude and latitude are the grid lines that encircle the Earth. The lines of latitude run from side to side, telling you how far north or south you are in the world, and the lines of longitude do exactly the same thing but the opposite. For sailors sailing the seas, to know where you are, you absolutely have to know both. Calculating latitude has always been easy. In the olden days, all sailors had to do was look at the sun and then, depending how high it was in the sky, measure the angle to work out the latitude. Somehow. The point is, it wasn't a problem. Longitude, however, was a big problem. How can you measure your eastness or westness using the sun when the sun spends all day gradually moving across the sky? That's why, for hundreds of years, the only way of measuring your longitude was an extremely unreliable method called dead reckoning, trying to figure out how far you travelled using estimations of speed and direction. This was often wildly inaccurate, mostly because currents don't have the common decency to tell you how much they've caused you to drift. And it turned out dead reckoning was a perfect name for it. In 1707, a British fleet under the command of Admiral Shovel found themselves in a dreadful fog in the English Channel. Shovel's navigators figured they were safely west of the coast. In fact, they were here, really close to the Scilly Isles. Thankfully, aboard the ship was a seaman who had been secretly keeping his own navigational records, who told Shovel he believed they were perilously close to the islands. Unthankfully, Shovel refused to listen to him and had him hanged for the crime of subversive navigating by an inferior, which was up there with the worst decisions Shovel ever made, apart from not changing his name. Four of his five ships crashed into the rocks and 2,000 men died. What the all because fuck? of the longitude problem. This sort of thing was happening too depressing. Dude, oh, can you can you imagine being that captain and having the fucking the guy hanged and then like you feel your ship crashes? As you sink into the ocean. Two thousand people. It was a, it was a 9-11. Almost. Increasingly frequently. And so, the longitude problem. This sort of thing was happening too depressingly frequently. And so, in 1714, Queen Anne of Great Britain set up the Longitude Prize. Whoever found a practical and accurate way of calculating longitude at sea would win £20,000, which in today's money is £20,000 plus inflation. Many great minds tried to come. I'm pretty sure that's millions. I'm pretty sure that's like an un like a huge amount of money. Come up with a sensible solution to the problem, including Galileo, Newton, Halley, and Cassini. But all of these textbook nerds fell short, instead accidentally discovering other, less consequential things in their endeavours to solve the longitude. The phrase, discovering the longitude, became a common way of saying something was completely impossible. There was a theoretically simple answer to the problem, as the Greeks had figured out in one of the many years before... Okay, sorry, a hundred pounds back then would be worth about 19,000 today. So 19, it'd be 19,000 times 200, right? Which would be, um, oh wow, that's like 40 million dollars. Yeah, okay, that's a lot. Christ, the best way of mastering longitude was to master time. The Greek sorry. Something was completely impossible. I'm back. There was a theoretically simple answer to the problem. As the Greeks had figured out in one of the many years before Christ, the best way of mastering longitude was to master time. The theory goes, if you know the exact time at a fixed location, you can use that, along with the sun, to figure out how far east or west you are. For example, if you knew that it was midnight in London, and where you were, the sun was at its highest point in the sky, you'd know you were on precisely the other side of the world from London. The catch is, for this method to work, your clock has to be unforgivingly accurate. Just one minute slow places you 0.25 degrees west of where you actually are. At the equator, that's a whopping 17 miles. In the 1700s, clocks worked on pendulums, and if pendulums ever had an Achilles heel, it was boats. 
keeping time on board a boat was so difficult, many sailors resorted to superstition. In a bid to know the time at a fixed location, they would stab a dog, put a bandage on it, take the bandage off, and put the injured dog on the ship. Then, every day at 12 o'clock, someone at home would dip the bandage in a bowl of sympathy powder. The dog on the ship would sense the powder and yelp in pain, telling the sailors it was noon precisely. Problems with this method included keeping a dog constantly both injured and alive, knowing which yelps were the sympathy yelps, as well as all other elements of the plan. So it was to the relief of dogs everywhere Average that the longitude Westerner. problem was eventually brilliantly solved by a rather unlikely Yorkshireman called John Harrison. Harrison showed a keen interest in clocks from an early age. Despite never having any formal education or working as a watchmaker's apprentice and being too poor even to own a watch, before he was 20, he'd figured out how to build a working clock made entirely of wood. Hey, check out my latest TikTok. Harrison quickly made a name for himself, building clocks on a shoestring budget that never erred by more than a second in a month. By contrast, the best clocks in those days drifted by a minute a day. When Jesus. Harrison heard about the Longitude Prize, he excitedly turned his attention to building a device that had no pendulum and could cope with extreme changes in humidity and temperature at sea. Thank you, thank you. May I present H1. It's the only clock of its kind. It's completely oil-free and pendulum-free, and it's performed perfectly on a test run to Lisbon. It's so accurate and seaworthy, it can solve the Longitude problem. I really hate it. Sorry, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Would you mind if I came back in a couple of years with an even more perfect one? Ladies and gentlemen, H2. It's even more accurate than H1 with an improved, sleek design. But I still really hate it. Can I have a couple more years, even more perfect one? H3. It's even more accurate than... Oh, I've just realised it's huge! Just as they were starting to worry Harrison was too much of a perfectionist to submit anything, he produced pocket watch-sized H4. This, I am happy with. But, uncharacteristically for Harrison, it was a case of very bad timing. By this time, the new head of the Board of Longitude was Astronomer Royal Neville Masklin. Masklin not only had the crucial say in who got the prize, he was also trying to win it. He'd been working on his own method of calculating longitude by mapping the position of like the moon in relation to the stars. Masklin, who openly described H4 as that plaguey watch, now decided it needed to pass a lot more tests. He confiscated H4 and kept it in his observatory for eight That's wild. It's literally a pocket watch. He j this guy just invented the... Everyone else was using clocks that were like 16 bells tied to a rope that a bird is sitting on, and when the bird caws, the bells ring. Like, that was, the, that was the clock everyone was using. And then this guy made a fucking pocket watch. What the fuck? Eight months, and by an amazing coincidence, in Masculine's own private tests, the watch didn't work so well. At the age of 79 and with time running out, Harrison, encouraged by his family, went to snitch on Masculine to King George III himself, who said, By God, Harrison, this is shocking treatment. I will see you right it. Ooh, can I have a go on your hammer? Bang, 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 bang. In 1773, at the orders of King George, Parliament granted Harrison the honour of being the man who solved the longitude and awarded him the cash prize he deserved. Oh, I'm the Board of Longitude never approved the decision. Masculine was still convinced he could find a better solution with his moon charts. But he never did. John Harrison died aged 83 on the same date he was born, a timekeeper to the last. The legacy of his chronometer would last for centuries, give or take a few minutes. In 1860, when the Royal Navy had fewer than 200 <laughs> ships, it had more than 800 chronometers, and Britain's naval dominance at the time was in no small part down to the navigational edge it gave them over their rivals. Oh, sorry, you guys are missing an important part of this video. It's the apology in the bottom right for the fact that this technology was what enabled British naval dominance. Just, just, so, just so you know, they feel bad about it. If you want to find out more about the fascinating history of the longitude problem, Davis Sobel wrote an excellent book called Longitude, which is full of dozens more unbelievable stories and details we didn't have time for. So, what was your favourite chapter? The middle. Why do I lend you books? The, the, the only good British YouTubers... I'm sorry guys, I don't give a fuck about any of you, I'm having fun. Hold on, where was um... Uh, where is why are all maps bad? Why every world map is wrong? Is that it? Is that it? Why everyone is wrong? Today, we'll be asking, is the world definitely round? Yes.
Welcome to Map Men. We're the men. And here's the map. Map Men, Map Men, Map, Map, Map Men, Men. Here at Map Men, we love a good globe. Because it's a map, but also a toy. But globes aren't very convenient because they're bulky and difficult to carry around. Unless your friends attach one to your head for your stag do and make you wear it all around Bristol. So, if you want the world in a book, or a poster, or a shower curtain, that globe is going to have to be flattened. But it's a notoriously challenging task. The best way to demonstrate the difficulty of displaying the curved earth on a flat map is to take an easy peel orange, and you'll find that even with a rolling pin, you just can't make the damn thing flat. Stupid orange, stop being round, stop being flat. But you can make juice. The only exception is the map produced by the Flat Earth Society, because apparently this is a real bird's eye view of the world. Antarctica conveniently encircles the Earth to stop the water falling off. So because Flat Earthers don't believe in the globe, they're not actually distorting it. But they are distorting the minds of vulnerable loners scouring the internet for answers in an increasingly incomprehensible world. Meanwhile, us gullible round Earth believers have a dilemma. You can't flatten a round thing without ruining it. You either have to stretch bits, squash bits or slice bits. But a clever solution came along in 1569 from a Belgian man... Flemish. Belgium wasn't a thing. Flemish man called Gerard Mercator. This is my Mercator costume. Yeah, Mercator was a globe maker who loved cricket and stag do's. His ingenious solution was to imagine the earth like a balloon covered in ink, and then imagine the balloon in a big cardboard tube, and then imagine inflating the balloon inside the tube, and then unfolding the big cardboard tube and looking at the results. This was impressive for a man who'd never travelled more than 200 kilometres from where he was born, and especially impressive as they hadn't even invented balloons, or big cardboard tubes, or Belgium. Mercator's projection became so successful it stood the test a very, very long time, and earned its status as the official, definitive flat map of the world. Maps using the Mercator projection have been used extensively in schools, TV weather maps, bad tattoos, it's even used by Apple Maps. So it's great. The end. <laughs> Whoa! Hold your onion, Sonny Jim Milledby boy. The Mercator projection is not without its problems. When you inflate a balloon in a tube, the top of the balloon has to stretch to touch the sides. As a result, countries near the poles look bigger. This has the naughty effect of making Greenland look about the same size as all of Africa, when in real life it's about the size of Greenland. As well as being inaccurate, more worryingly, it's a bit racist. It's well known that the Mercator projection was designed to make the colonial powers of Northern Europe look bigger and make Africa look smaller. Well, that's wrongly well known. The Mercator projection had nothing to do with racism and everything to do with navigation. Before Mercator, all maps had a problem. If you were a sailor and tried following a straight line on the map, the curvature of the Earth meant you gradually drift off course. Help! But with the Mercator projection, a straight line on the map was the same as a straight line on the sea. As long as your compass wasn't broken. OK, I hereby concede that the Mercator projection is not racist on purpose, but it was still a problem that needed solving. So, in the 1970s, a German man called Arno Peters tried... tried to make a better map. Why is this my Arno Peters costume? Revenge. Oh. The Peters projection sacrifices accuracy of shape in favour of accuracy of scale. The polar regions are squished and the bits near the equator are stretched, fixing the Greenland problem and making Russia look far less intimidating. It's a great map. It's a terrible map. Why? First of all, Arno is a stupid name. Secondly, he wasn't a map maker. He was a publicist <coughs> who copied the work of James Gall, work which was so abundantly terrible it should never have been copied in the first place. Look at the shape of Africa. It's awful. Can I say something controversial? Go on. So what? <gasps> Ask yourself, what is the point of a map on a classroom wall? Is it to teach children how to navigate the ocean in a boat? No, it's so they can understand the world around them. And understanding something like Africa is huge is pretty important. I think it's important that Africa doesn't look like a sad piece of melted cheese. Well, ultimately, there is no right answer. Except mine. Because every flat map of a round world is necessarily wrong. But loads of map makers have tried to come up with their own solutions. Oh, it said for ages, sorry. Piece of melted cheese. Well, ultimately, there is no right answer. Except mine. Because every flat map of a round world is necessarily wrong. But loads of map makers have tried to come up with their own solutions over the years. And here are a few of our favourite attempts. Ugh. Ugh. Oh, that's clever. <laughs> no. Ooh, pointy. Mm, not bad, but quite bad. Nope, 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 nope. Ah! Ah! <laughs> so it looks like the only way round the pesky projection problem is to join the Flat Earth Society. Jay, will you do the honours? Gladly. Come on, be flat, you stupid. That's a sturdy globe. Be flat, flatten. Why aren't you flat, you stupid?
stupid big round <laughs> I hate my job. I hate my life. I want to- They do song skits for their ads, too. These guys are so fucking high effort. Can I do one more? I'm allowed to do one more, I think. It's my stream. I can do one more. Wait, which one do I want to do? Uh, let's do a short one. Just a short one, okay? Watch the ad. To get out of here, I wish that I could learn the skills to start a new career. You can, you know, I tell you how you go to Skillshare.com where you can learn a lesson or two. Such as what? Well, editing skills, graphic design, how to create fantastic apps, music production, leadership skills, digital illustrated maps. But how can I afford it? All those classes sound so dear. No, they're not. It's just $10 a month to sign up for a year. Wow. Skillshare. More than 28,000 courses. Skillshare. One of my favorite web resources, by the way, they've got a very special offer for you. You simply go to school.stroke.map.men2 And you'll get Skillshare free for two months, and guess what else will happen? The more of you sign up, the bigger the fee they pay to map men. Skillshare! Yeah, there you go. Now, now, you, now you, get the, you get the vibes now, thank you. Uh, have you seen the Politics and Boring series? Yeah, yeah, I've seen Unfinished London. Yeah, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Finish it? Oh my god. Click on the link that's down this way. Skillshare! I'm going to quit my job today. I'm off to start a brand new life and Skillshare is my chance. Not so fast, you've got to give your notice in four months in advance. No. It's, it's, it's really good. Yeah, they switched voices. I don't know why. That must have made it harder to, to do, you know. Oh, this is an interesting one. Welcome to Map Men. We're the men, and here's the map. Today's map is of the disputed border between Egypt and Sudan. 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 In particular, this bit here called Bir Tawil. A bit of land the size of London, which nobody wants. As with many badly drawn borders, it starts with the British. So we'll draw a line here in the middle of the desert, ignoring all tribal boundaries, because we own this place anyway, so I don't really see it being a problem. Can I please have a sandwich? It turns out the British got very good at drawing straight lines, seemingly unaware of all the trouble they were to cause. But once a line's been drawn, that's final, right? Unright. Three years later, in 1902, the British drew a new line to better reflect cultural differences. We should never have drawn that straight line. I can assure you the man who drew that line has been shamed. So now there were two borders, a straight one and a squiggly one. And here came the problem. This area, known as the Halaib Triangle, was valuable and both sides wanted to control it. So Egypt claimed the straight line and Sudan claimed the squiggly line. The side effect, if either side claimed Bir to will, they'd have to give up the Halaib Triangle. It remains the only disputed territory in the world where both sides insist it's not theirs. So, we could just go and claim it? Technically, yes. In 2014, an American named Jeremiah Heaton travelled to Beer to Will and claimed it for himself so that his seven-year-old daughter could fulfil her dream of being a real princess. Ain't nothing more important than my daughter's happiness. And now she's got everything she ever wanted, isn't that right, Sugar Plum? <laughs> so, due to the value of the hala Triangle, Beer to Will, with literally nothing in it, is internationally recognised as Terra Nullius. And although many people have tried to claim it, including worryingly Google, <laughs> a lack of UN recognition, <laughs> or indeed any kind of recognition from anybody, has left these claims as hollow as this globe. <laughs> Goodbye. God, fuck, dude, they're so good. Wait, where's the what makes a country? Is that, is that one of their, is that one of their, their maps? What makes a country? What makes... How do you start a new country? The word country. Okay, this is the last one for sure. Okay, we can't do any more after this. We have to do at least one segment or my editors are gonna kill me, okay? Last one. These are based as shit. You should sub to the channel. Even though it's a much larger channel than me and... Okay. The word country can be hard to pin down. It can be nation, state, nation state, the outdoors, or a genre of music. But how does a country become a country? In today's program, we'll look at what it takes to change the world map. Welcome to Map Men. We're the men. This video the is actually map super men, based, I think, men, politically. Map, 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 map. The world map is reassuringly solid, with clear, thick black lines to let you know what's one thing and what's not that one thing. 
It appears so fixed, people are willing to get it tattooed onto their skin, presumably so they can then colour in the countries they visit to show everyone how cultured and worldly and annoying they are. But of course, the world map does change as new countries spring into existence. The most recent examples include Timor-Leste in 2002, Montenegro in 2006, and... South Sudan. South Sudan in 2011. The good news is, anybody can claim a country. All you have to do is say, this is mine. The bad news is, getting the rest of the world to agree with you is mega hard. We're going to have a look at what separates those who have been successful from those that have been not or unsuccessful. And few people have been more not successful than Englishman Stuart Hill, who in February 2011 founded the country of Forvik. Stuart Hill's story begins during a failed attempt to circumnavigate Great Britain in a rowing boat with a wind sail stuck in it. After eight expensive rescue call-outs, Stuart wound up in hospital in the Shetland Islands, from where he soon discovered the tiny uninhabited island of Forvik. Stuart liked Forvik so much, he set his sights on being the supreme ruler of it. After doing lots of careful reading into the history of the Shetland Islands, he summarised what he read into a dubious argument, that they were technically still part of the old Norse Empire, not Scotland, and therefore Forvik was free to claim. First Minister? Stuart Hill. Population? Stuart Hill. Name? Stuart Hill. Stuart was so convinced of Forvik's sovereignty, he refused to pay vehicle tax and was sent to prison. Stuart issued a statement saying, I'm right and they're wrong. Stuart Hill. Although his country <laughs> has a flag and a website, Forvik remains Fucking part base. of Scotland on all world maps. Except those drawn by Stuart. So how do you go about creating a new country that appears on everyone else's world maps? The thing you need to get most maps to give you a thick black outline is a seat at the United Nations, the international body that agrees international things. But how do you get that seat? Whose email address do you need? Should you sign off yours sincerely or yours faithfully? And will that make the difference? The UN have a strict set of requirements all applicants have to meet in order to be considered. The first of which is... Do you have a historical connection to the land? Is this where Stuart, an Englishman claiming part of Scotland, went wrong? What if Stuart's family had lived on Forvik for thousands of years? Is an ancestral link enough to convince the UN you're a country? Let's look at an example that answers that very question. The Black Hills of northern USA have been the ancestral lands of the Lakota Native Americans for centuries. And in 1868, the US government recognised this in a treaty that promised the land to the Lakota forever. But forever did not, it turned out, mean until we find gold, which happened shortly after. The Lakota were offered compensation of half a billion dollars for the stolen territory, but they've always refused the money, insisting their ancestral lands are not for sale. Bad. In 2007, the Lakota of Dakota declared an independent nation of Lakota, breaking away from the United States, taking with them the giant faces of four American presidents in a mountain. With the legal treaty providing indisputable evidence that the Lakota technically owned the land, surely the UN would make good straight away and confirm a shiny new country. Unfortunately for them, their coloniser also happened to be the richest country in the world, with enormous influence on what does and doesn't get ratified. America looked at their proposal, thought very hard, and said no. And absolutely nobody was surprised. Hard evidence in the form of clear documentation wasn't enough to get independence. But consider this example from the other side of the planet, a claim to independence based on a lack of documentation. The Murawari Aborigines have never accepted that their land officially belongs to Australia. Nobody ever signed a treaty with them, beat them in a war, or even so much as set foot in their territory when Australia was founded. In March 2013, the Murawari wrote a letter to the Prime Minister of Australia and the Queen of England, head of state in Australia, long story, asking to see documents proving that Australia were their rightful owners. After 21 days, the Murawari decided to interpret the ensuing silence as recognition. In March 2013, they formally declared the continuance of their statehood and asked the UN to recognise a new country twice the size of Denmark. But without any real geopolitical power behind them, the UN just loudly ignored their declaration, to this day leaving Australia in charge of collecting Murawari bins. So sometimes you need to do more than politely submit a proposal. The UN might also consider... Have you fought any lengthy or bloody civil wars? If you want to make the UN really sit up and pay attention, you need what's creepily referred to as a monopoly over violence, or total military control. This can be a surefire route to recognition. Examples include Bangladesh, Venezuela, the USA, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, India, Pakistan, Algeria, Latvia, Namibia and Portugal, to name but 12. A more recent and more ongoing example can be found in East Africa. When ex-British Somaliland got independence in the 60s, they joined with their ex-Italian neighbours to become one happy Horn of African country. <laughs> This happiness quickly became unhappiness under a brutal dictatorship. And, following a devastating civil war, Somaliland once again declared independence in 1991. Today, Somaliland have their own separate military, passports, even currency. Somaliland sent a request to the UN asking for their seal of approval, but despite fitting all the criteria for becoming a new country, the UN still hasn't lifted a finger. 
It doesn't help that other African nations refuse to acknowledge Somaliland's independence. Countries like Mali and Morocco, with separatist movements of their own, are terrified of an independence domino effect. So Somaliland remains in limbo as an autonomous region of Somalia. Despite its clearly enforced border, Google Maps doesn't even bother with a dotted line, let alone a solid one. Why is it so hard to get the attention of the UN? How come Somaliland didn't manage it, but South Sudan did? South Sudan successfully became the world's newest proper recognised by the UN country in July 2011. Exactly like Somaliland, they had a historical claim to their land, fought a civil war, and were just as politically obscure in the eyes of the world's richest countries. So what was that final missing piece that made the UN pay There's attention? There's an X behind my camera. Hello, I'm George Clooney, and I think South Sudan should be a new country. Ah, ah that's why. Course. Hollywood humanitarian George Clooney has been raising awareness about the plight of the Sudanese ever since the Darfur conflict in the mid-2000s. Nobody cares about Sudan. I said I'm George Clooney and I can make people care about South Sudan because I say I care. I mean, because I do care. I'm not acting now, this is real. Damn it. Oh my God, you are George Clooney, winner of an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. Sudan in two, you say? Consider it done. I'm a hero. And therein lies the lesson for Stuart Hill. What he should have done was get Reese Witherspoon to do a tweet about Forvik's cruel subjugation by the British, and he just might have got somewhere. Around the world, there are but dozens more examples of are they or aren't they countries. Many behave exactly like countries with passports, governments and currencies. And whilst not having a comfy chair at the United Nations, do still feature on the maps of their political allies, Palestine, Taiwan and Kosovo, to name but two and a half. Despite the UN being a very popular method by which to judge the countryness of a country, at the end of the day, there's no such thing as official. The world map looks different depending on which country you're looking at it in, and countryness will always be a grey area. Does that mean I can declare my half of the desk an independent country? Yes, but I'd only invade. And I deserve it. <laughs> okay, we have to stop. We have to stop. We have to stop. This is the laziest day of Bosch content in a long time. Not that I mind. They're, uh, they're, they're good. They're good!